Thank you all very much for coming. Um, I'm Nick Stern. I'm a professor of the, indeed, the IG Patel Professor of Economics and Government here at the London School of Economics. Um, we're very privileged uh, to have uh, an extraordinarily distinguished panel um, here today to discuss um, a book, The New Bihar, Rekindling Governance and uh, Development. Um, this is uh, an edited volume with some of um, the most distinguished commentators in and on India contributing. You will be able to buy this book on the way out. So that's one of the privilege uh, of being here, those of you who haven't already bought the book on the way <laughs> in. Rekindling Governance and Development was a very deliberate subtitle because this is a story of a turnaround in Bihar, which you'll be hearing presented and discussed by this panel, particularly dating from uh, 2005 and the election of Chief Minister Nitish Kumar. But there was a focus on governance as the route to accelerating development. So that's a key theme of this book, rekindling governance and development, because governance and development in uh, Bihar has a very long history over two millennia. So it's rekindling. That was an important part of the title as well. Now, I was very fortunate to be invited by my very long standing friend, N.K. Singh, um, member of the Raja Sabha, very distinguished uh, Indian civil servant, um, Bihari, of course, and uh, very active in this history of the turnaround in Bihar. And uh, he very kindly asked me to join him, and I learned a lot in the process. But I can never be as deeply knowledgeable about Bihar as he is. So I always look forward to hearing from NK. And he will be the co-chair of the proceedings today. NK will um, chair the um, panel and the discussion of the panelists who I'm about to introduce on this table, and then I will chair the Q&A. And we can compare who were the most unruly um, of the audience and the panel at the end of the <laughs> session. Um, we do have a tradition in LSE of not dwelling on agreement, but we also have a tradition at the LSE of listening carefully to what other people say. And uh, it's quite possible to put those two things together, and uh, we will. So um, on the panel, um, we have, um, in alphabetical order, Danny Alexander, MP, who's Chief Secretary to the Treasury. Those of you who know the UK well <coughs> will recognise that the Chief Secretary to the Treasury is uh, the person with the hands on whatever money is left. <laughs> <laughs> and alloc allocates it uh, with discipline, integrity, and strategy. And that's what Danny does most of the time, but he's very kindly uh, taken time off to be with us this, this evening. He has to leave at 7.30, so when he slips out, it's not in relation to what anybody has uh, just said. <laughs> the, the reason that we asked uh, Danny is because uh, when he went to India at the end of last year, um, he particularly asked to go to Bihar. So you will see, uh, you hear some perhaps questions or whatever it is that Danny has to say from the perspective of somebody who is very interested as an outsider but has gone as an outsider to have a first look. Um, we have um, Lord Karan Bilamoria. He's my colleague as, uh, or I am his colleague as a crossbench peer in the House of Lords. Crossbench peer means nobody tells us how to vote, and um, <laughs> that's a, a special privilege of not being told. Right. And he is the founder, those of you who like your beer, as <coughs> I do, he's the founder and chairman <coughs> of Cobra Beer. Um, we have uh, His Excellency Ranjan Matai, who's the High Commissioner of India to the UK, came um, in December. And uh, it's a great pleasure, Ranjan, to have you here. Um, the High Commissioner is always close to the LSE. We think um, physically 
intellectually and spiritually. So um, <laughs> welcome, welcome. We have um, Suhil Seth, who's the managing partner of Councilage India, and um, a commentator within India, as many of you will know, to whom uh, many uh, pay close attention. So that's the panel. I'm now going to uh, hand over to my dear friend and the leader of this uh, project on this book, N.K. Singh. N.K., could you please chair the panel? Thank you very much, uh, Nick. Uh, thank you for uh, those warm words. It seems it's a pleasure for me to be here at the London School of Economics, which is really basically your venue, Nick, since uh, the initial uh, release of this book, if you recall, was uh, by the President of India when Amartya Sen had done the, uh, <coughs> the launch of this book. That was a few months ago. And at that time, we felt that perhaps uh, um, a session at the London School of Economics would add great value in mm. understanding some of the problems which this book uh, seeks to deal with. Now, basically, I think that this book seeks to bring out three components. And first and foremost, as you rightly pointed out, that uh, Bihar has had a long and rich history, going back to several millennium, perhaps the oldest democracy in the world, the seat of great power of the Mauryans and the Guptas, the sweep of the empire from Patliputra, the uh, which is now Patna, extended way beyond the subcontinent into parts of Afghanistan. But Bihar fell into bad days progressively and hit the rock bottom when for nearly two decades its rate of growth was uh, just about 2.5 to 3 percent with per capita income hanging around at uh, just half a percent or so and therefore it got left behind in the mainstream of India's economic development. So as India caught on after 1991, registering very dramatic rates of growth, having conquered the status quo of the Hindu rate of growth, uh, Bihar seemed to have been left behind in this, particular, in this particular overall strategy. But what the last eight or nine years has seen, has seen three important ingredients. And those ingredients have a value, in my view, which extends far beyond Bihar, not only to other parts of India, but to other emerging markets. Because there would be areas, there would be pockets, there would be provinces, there would be areas which lag behind the mainstream. And what are really, therefore, the lessons, in a generic sense of the term, which Bihar's recent growth performance seeks to bring out? Now, first, one word on the growth performance. Now, just to give one example of what this growth performance has meant is that in the 11th five-year plan, which ended two years ago, Bihar was the fastest growing state, having registered a growth rate of around 11.8%, which is far higher than what India achieved. Last year, Bihar grew at 13.5%, and the year before last, at 12%. And one of the jokes which I have not uh, ever failed to crack is that when I worked in the Ministry of Finance as Secretary in the Ministry of Finance, Dr. Manmohan Singh, who at that time was the Finance Minister of India, used to somewhat in tongue-in-cheek joke with me that India, NK, will only prosper if Bihar <clears throat> ceases to become a basket case. He perhaps realized that this would never likely to happen and that, therefore, this would remain rather a tongue-in-cheek remark. I had the pleasure of getting my own back on him when about four months ago, uh, after an intensive question hour, as he was walking out, I met him in the corridor and reminded him of this conversation, but did tell him that Bihar has, uh, is growing at 13.5%. <clears throat> when will India catch up with Bihar's rate of growth <laughs> having slumped from 9.5% uh, uh, to uh, almost, below, uh, almost below 5% now. Now, the broad story, I think, of Bihar's economic strategy is three. 
First and foremost, I think that it's a classic example of something that is being loosely described as the peace dividend. That if you guarantee security of life and property, which is very basic, which people take for granted in this country and some other parts of the world, but this is not necessarily what can be taken for granted. But if you do guarantee security of life and property, then I think you trigger off the huge energy, entrepreneurial energy latent in every individual and the aggregation of these micro decisions, decisions to buy a house, to buy a property, to invest in some other goods and products. If you reverse expectations, where you reverse a certainty of pessimism into optimism for the future, then you make a qualitative difference in the outlook, and this is fundamental and basic. And the multiplier effects of the peace dividend is something which I think the Bihar example would be a good example to study from. The second broad conclusion which this book contains, broadly speaking, is that if you wish to have a growth which is sustainable, then you certainly wish to pursue your economic strategy in a twofold way. One, a direct targeting of beneficiaries in terms of people who have been left out of the mainstream, left, left out women, the youth, the minorities, the underprivileged, and bring them into the mainstream by specifically targeted programs, the direct action program. Couple this with indirect action program, which is to improve the overall infrastructure, quality of education, quality of health services, which benefits the entire segment of population across the board. And it is this convergence of the direct and indirect uh, application of an economic strategy, which is unique to what has been come to be loosely described as the Bihar model or development. This bring, book brings out perhaps some of the features of this, the advantages and the disadvantages. So that's the second broad overall conclusion. The third overall conclusion that this book has is I think that it, it emphasizes that mere investment in physical infrastructure would be inadequate if you do not pay adequate attention to education, to health, to social services, and generally improving the connectivity to rural areas. So I think that it is the integrated growth strategy, which I think is at the heart of the Bihar turnaround story. Has the battle been won? No. Are the challenges over? No. If indeed, if Bihar continues to grow, at 13%, it would take it 20 years to approximate India's economic average rate of growth. So I think that it requires, therefore, not only to continue with this momentum, it requires an additional and incremental support from the central government, and that is at the heart of the anomalies of the present skewed up fiscal structure of devolutions, on which I'm sure Danny would know a great deal. But I think that in, in working fiscal federal models, you need to have a system which needs to equalize the rates of growth on the principle that equal levels of taxation should give equal quality of services and equal life quality which can be guaranteed to its people. So I think these are some of the broad conclusions which this book deals with. It deals with the case of what, what we have achieved the first chapter of Amartya Sen, which is very readable, Bihar, past, present, and future. There are chapters which are devoted to uh, infrastructure. There are chapters which, is, which are devoted to health and education. Case of half full, and there's an entire segment of case half empty, and it ends the last section with crystal gazing and the challenges which have yet to be addressed. So on the whole, I think it is a story which is capable of being replicated in other parts, wherever you have the challenges, where parts of the country, regions and areas have been left behind from the overall mainstream. Nick, would you like to add your own comments to some of the comments that I have made before I continue to moderate the discussion further? Nick. Thank you, NK. And uh, thank you also for your big part in making this story happen. 
Now, I don't um, want Danny Alexander to think I've ducked out of a challenge, and I did say that I would say that he's Member of Parliament for Inverness, Nairn, Badenoch, and Strath Bay. Now, <laughs> that was in a West London <coughs> accent, Pronounced. which is where I grew up. I'm not sure how you say it properly, but I thought I couldn't duck out of the challenge of saying it, so I did. Now, on to the story. Um, I want to just make three remarks from the perspective of someone who's studied um, the economics of development for all his professional life of 45 years now, I think. So what are the lessons for the story of development from Bihar? I think the first one is a strategy that looks at the investment climate and investing in people. That twin strategy is capable of delivering not only rapid growth, but growth that includes poorer people in the story. So investment climate and investing in people. What is the investment climate? The investment climate is shaped by the um, behavior of the government, and it's shaped by infrastructure and institutions. The investment climate is the, conf is the confidence that people can have in gaining the returns from the investment that they make. If that confidence is uh, killed, then investment is killed. Government-induced policy risk, whichever country in the world or whichever parts of countries in the world you look at, is the enemy of investment. Government-induced policy risk takes different forms in different places. Um, in India particularly, it's uh, around uh, physical security. It's about the behavior of the police and the judiciary. It's about the behavior of bureaucrats. And it's the functioning of the investment, uh, of the infrastructure itself. If you can't get your goods from one place to another, if you can't get your goods uh, through the rail yards or the ports, that is uh, an environment in which you don't gain the returns from your investment. So that's a very big lesson. You change the investment climate, the response from investors is very powerful. Investing in people, well, in particular, education and health, and in particular in uh, girls and women, is very powerful in the whole story, not only of growth itself, but also the ability to participate in growth. So those twin pillars, investment climate and investing in people, are underlined very strongly as, a, as together a growth strategy by what happened in Bihar. The second point I want to make is that we talk a lot about how governance is so important for development. Governance institutions are a colossal theme in development economics research around the world. But it's another question, how do you change governance? We've seen lots of examples of how governance spirals down, downwards. But there are not so many examples of how governance can improve, and improve quite quickly. That's why this is such an important lesson for those of us who study investment. And inspirationally, if you're looking at the security side, I can't go on, but I'll just give one example. Um, the police in Bihar were a very difficult um, uh, part of the whole governance process, often uh, corrupt, often not under proper uh, control. So what happened? Well, this was the strategy. There is an institution in India that works quite well, and uh, there's more than one in institution in <laughs> India that works well. But those of you um, who, who've worked and know India, particularly, of course, those of you who are Indian, will recognize that the Indian Army has worked pretty well over time in terms of integrity, following discipline, um, having the appropriate degree of independence from government and the appropriate degree of responsiveness to government. So um, the insight here was, well, why don't we get people who've grown up had their professional lives in that kind of institution and bring them into the police force. So a lot of people from the army, retired um, people from the army or the military, moved into, um, were hired into the police force. And the atmospherics and the discipline 
changed. So it's an example of looking and understanding the institutions and seeing how you can bring experience and lessons from one kind of institution that works quite well to another that was working rather badly. And that was really an extraordinary, not only insight, but there's one thing to have an insight. We do insights at university, but it's another to actually make things happen. And that's much more uh, difficult. And that, I think, was an example of how <coughs> governance changed. Um, the other examples were, uh, that in education and health, which um, um, NK has pointed to, and I, I won't repeat. But in that context, attendance of the teachers at school and, inten and the attendance of the um, medical officials is a key part of the whole story of improving delivery. Don't look first at the attendance of children or whether people go to health centres. Look first at whether the teachers show up and whether the health officials show up. And then if you're changing the environment in favour of greater discipline, then you can find ways of um, encouraging that. The last point I want to make is when do you support change? In India, of course, particularly it's a question of when does the centre support change? But for um, a country like the UK, which has um, admirably backed its uh, development department, uh, DFID, the Department for International Development, you always have to ask the question, who do you try to support? Mm. Well, two key components in answering that question, it's obviously a fairly nuanced question in different circumstances, but two central elements. The right time to give people support is when they're creating an environment where things can happen. <clears throat> and secondly, if that place is poor. And clearly, uh, Bihar satisfies both criteria. It's still a very poor uh, state. It still has the highest proportion amongst the big states of people in poverty. So um, it seems to me that now is the moment uh, for the center of um, uh, the federal structure in India to increase its support to Bihar. And I wish the British government wasn't moving out of India because this would have been a moment for DIPID to increase its support for Bihar. But I'm confident that, uh, at least I'm not confident, I hope we will find ways within the structures of our relationship uh, with India, between the UK and India, of um, at least offering some kind of support. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nick. Uh, for those uh, observations. Uh, may I now request uh, Danny Alexander uh, to make some observations. Considering the fact, Danny, that you have just come back from Bihar, I mean, you are in the best position to share your first-hand experience, good, bad, and indifferent. So the floor is yours, Danny. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. I I've, uh, feel like I've been invited along here to give the uh, untreated ex uh, 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 my untreated views and then hear from the uh, experts uh, in response, because I'm, unlike everyone else in this panel, not someone who's had years of experience engaging with uh, Bihar, but has recently been and have a few uh, observations. My first observation is, before I left my visit to, uh, to India, and I was explaining to people, some of whom were Indian, some of whom weren't, uh, where I was going and why, um, uh, I had lots of kind of quizzical ex uh, expressions, eyebrows raised when I said, well, I'm you know, going to Delhi and to Mumbai, which is what everyone expects British ministers visiting India to do, but I'm also going to visit Patna, and I'm going to go to be... And people said, well, why are you doing that? That's a sort of strange thing to, 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 to do. That was the response I had from, from, from a lot of people. So I thought I might first explain why it was I wanted to go there in the, in, in the first place, and then a little bit about uh, my observations, uh, having done that. And I guess there are a number of, of, of reasons. Um, firstly, and it's, it's uh, to, to, to Nick's point, I wanted to see somewhere where the UK has been very engaged, where DFID has been very engaged. And I'd say that we've had to, I, I, as Chief Secretary, uh, and I'm not going to enter into a lengthy disquisition on fiscal federalism, though I guess if I was really, <laughs> uh, really pushed, I probably uh, could. But given that we're uh, engaged in a, a referendum in Scotland, I suspect that some of our current <laughs> structures are, uh, are under examination uh, at the moment. Um, but that's the last I'll say about Scotland at this meeting, uh, at least. Um, 
uh, I wanted to see somewhere where DFID had been very involved and, and very uh, engaged, because from my point of view, one of the things that I'm most proud of as a coalition government that we've achieved is meeting the 0.7% commitment uh, of our national resources on uh, international aid. That was met for the first time in the 2013 uh, calendar year. Uh, it's something which uh, I and my party and other, many others uh, in other parties and across the NGO sector have campaigned for. Um, and it's been testing to meet it when we're having to make reductions in so many other areas. But I think it's the, absolutely the right thing to do. And I wanted to see, as part of my visit, somewhere where uh, we'd been spending some of our resources. And Nick, we're not pulling out of India. Um, we, are, we are changing the nature of our uh, DFID relationship with, uh, with uh, India for uh, a variety uh, of, I think, good reasons to have a partnership that's much more focused on technical expertise, on supporting private sector, uh, based solutions to development problems. Actually, one of the things I did when I was in India in the uh, Mumbai part of my trip was to launch the first phase of investments of a new <laughs> partnership that DFID has been engaged in, the Samridi Fund, which is about returnable capital, investing in uh, private sector uh, organizations, some of which are uh, doing uh, business in Bihar, bringing power, for example, to, uh, to, to, to rural communities. And actually, one of my questions for the panel, I, I expect I'm going to be in the position of asking a few questions and leaving before I hear the answers. But one of the, my questions for, for other panelists is, given the nature of um, the commitment that the UK has made to, to Bihar, along, many other, uh, along with many others, and the changing nature of our aid and, and DFID relationship with India, what are the best sorts of things that we could be doing within that framework to support the continued uh, development uh, of, uh, of Bihar? But the second reason, apart from that, that was that we, we had this combination of a place that it was one of the poorest and most populous places in India, but also a place which had seen these fantastic rates of growth. Um, and so trying to understand what it was that had, 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 had led to that was the second reason for my uh, visit. Uh, during uh, my visit, had the, had the we'll hear from Lord Billamoria uh, a little later, but I had the privilege of, of visiting the Cobra Beer uh, uh, factory there, which is an important UK uh, investment, uh, a private sector investment. Uh, I had the pleasure of visiting a uh, one of the programs run by the Lumba Foundation. I see my good friend Lord Raj Lumba uh, uh, in the second front uh, row there uh, as an example of a, a British-based charity that's supporting activities. Uh, so it's not, this is not just about government, it's about private sector, it's about uh, private charities too. Uh, supporting, in that case, uh, widows to gain skills necessary to actively participate uh, in the economy, um, which was a very inspiring thing to see. But actually, the thing that caught my imagination most was visiting in a, in a, in a village outside Patna, one of the public service delivery counters, um, which has been set up under the Right to Public Services Act, which is about people being able to gain access to basic public services in a way that is direct and uh, and, and uh, easily monitored, uh, uses new technology, and uh, 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 I think eliminates might be too strong, but certainly very much reduces the ability for corruption to disturb these sorts of transactions. Um, and the, the, from the people I spoke to, both the people who worked there and the people who were using the service, the impact that that had made on people's lives, and to go to the point that Nick made about a degree of certainty, this wasn't in this case about investment, just about the way people could organize their lives, that simple change had made was really quite dramatic. And actually, I suspect some of the uh, delivery times uh, and the penalties for failure are things that could usefully be introduced in some UK public services. So I should also be, um, uh, be, 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 looking at that, be looking at that too. But that was a... Um, uh, an, an example of one of the observations I'd make, which is um, the importance of uh, uh, improving governance and eliminate and, re and removing opportunities for corruption to enabling economic development. I mean, it's, it's not it's not an it's not a, uh, it's, it's, an, it's an obvious point, but it's clearly something that has made, at least from my very brief experience, made a big difference uh, in, uh, uh, in 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 Bihar. Um, I think that. Uh, and, and I guess one of my other, therefore, one of my other questions is uh, about uh, to what extent those improvements in, govern in governance uh, and in leadership, which we've seen in recent years in Bihar, are sustainable and can be continued. Uh, are they um, the, 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 uh, the prerogative of, of um, one leader and, and his regime, or are they things that are established in the institutions? The strong institutions, in the end, are something which is enormously important in any country. 
um, and or indeed any region. And I'd be interested in people's observations on whether those institutions that have been developed recently are going to have the capacity to endure or whether they can be disturbed by election results, political change, uh, 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 and, and so on. And then my last observation is that actually, uh, despite all the very obvious uh, uh, differences that are uh, between the UK and Bihar, which are enormous and manifest and I'm not going to dwell on, actually many of the things that, um, that support economic development are universal. And there are issues that we have in the United Kingdom too. Investment in, uh, in infrastructure. Um, uh, I've traveled a lot on the, the road network, largely very slowly, despite the efforts of the excellent police force to make sure that we could, we could, we could uh, maintain progress. Um, some of the discussions I had in, uh, in, in Mumbai were about how can we achieve more private sector investment in infrastructure in India. Clearly, it's a huge issue, whether it's about roads or or transport, and getting goods to market, uh, whether it's about power, which seemed to be a, a major issue um, in the, the people I met uh, in Bihar. So that would be another question, is how can we then, uh, what can we in this country do, but how can we make sure that the investment in infrastructure is delivered? Likewise, the investment in human capital, big issue here, jobs, skills, particularly for, 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 for younger people. One of the things that differed is spending actually the vast majority of the I think 230 odd million pounds of our current program in Bihar is on health, basic nutrition for children, uh, and so on. Um, but what, what, you know, where are the next things in terms of human capital investment that are needed really to enable the recent progress to, to be sustained? But my overall impression was of a place that was really working hard to, um, uh, and had a lot of commitment from the people I met and the businesses I met to securing a better economic future for its people. Um, but where that the, the, both the governance and the infrastructure, real improvements have been made, but the, the, the question in my mind is, um, you know, are, are those things which are sustainable in the long term? I hope they are. I hope I'll have an opportunity to return in the not too distant future uh, to, see, uh, to see further uh, progress. Certainly it's a place that has uh, captured my interest and imagination in a way that I hadn't expected when the program was drawn up by my officials for my visit. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, you have asked a number of questions, uh, Danny. I think that we'll, we'll return to them uh, very shortly. Uh, but you did say it has certainly caught your interest and uh, it has caught your imagination. Uh, now, uh, uh, Karan, you are a major investor in Bihar. Uh, would you want to say something on this particular question of uh, Danny, having caught his interest and caught his imagination. Has it caught yours, not only because you are an investor, but would you want to deepen that investment uh, foray which you have now made into Bihar? Uh, thank you very much, NK. And uh, Danny, thank you for visiting Bihar um, when you went to India and for visiting our brewery and seeing firsthand uh, the opportunities and the challenges there. Uh, when we first decided to brew in Bihar and then to buy the only brewery in the state. I remember my, my family and my friends in India saying, are you in your right senses? <laughs> Bihar? Are you sure? Do you know what you're doing? Have you got kidnap insurance? Are you going to have armed guards? And the perception of Bihar is still, if you talk to people in India, what Bihar used to be like seven, eight years ago. People have not seen firsthand the change in Bihar. Um, and, and I said, no, well, I, I believe this state is changing. And I took a punt. I took a risk. I went against the grain. And we decided to invest in Bihar and Molson Coors Cobra, my joint venture with, with Molson Coors. We bought the only brewery in Bihar. And in two and a half years, we've made, and Danny's seen it firsthand, um, amazing progress. We've tripled the capacity of the brewery. We've modernized it. Um, and it's got the most modern brewery laboratory probably in India, uh, right in the heart of Bihar. And we have a water effluent treatment plant so that any wastewater is almost drinkable at the end of it. Um, we have a rice husk boiler where we create energy using waste rice husk. So it's amazing what can be done, but, but, but the reality is we are still the only foreign multinational company in Bihar. Carlsberg Brewery have followed in our footsteps, so we have 
that foot in the door, that opening of the wedge has now started bringing others in. Carlsberg will be starting production <coughs> in Bihar very soon, and we welcome the competition. And hopefully there will be many, many more uh, foreign companies coming into Bihar. But to Danny's question about um, how sustainable is all this, well, there's no question that this has all been happened in Bihar, that crime has gone down six times in six years because of leadership, because of Nitish Kumar coming in and changing the whole environment. You can't run away from that. Now, if you have another leader who is not of the same um, strength, mindset, vision, it's questionable whether it is sustainable. And I think that on the one hand, you go to Bihar. I've just come back from the Harvard Business School. I, I spend a week there every year for the last 12 years. Whenever I'm at Harvard, it feels a bit new compared with Cambridge or Oxford. But then Nalanda University was closing down when Oxford and Cambridge were opening. And when you go to Bihar, you get this great sense of history, and your great sense of this was the heart of India for centuries and centuries. This was the greatest of the Indian empires. We talk about the Roman, Persian, Greek empires. People don't talk about the Mauryan Empire and the great Emperor Ashoka. So that history, that culture is there. It's a question of today building those institutions. And what DFID have done, what the Open University have done, what British Council have done in helping train teachers, the tests system that we have in implemented there, training hundreds of thousands of teachers using new technology. Nitish Kumar, when I first met him, said, we want our people to learn English. We want my teachers to learn English, to teach English. You wouldn't have heard that in Bihar. Eight years ago, it would have been no English, only Hindi. Complete change. And now we've, we've got a program called Bliss, which has been put into place with DFID and the British Council. Fantastic teaching English. So I really hope that that help that DFID has been providing. And every time I speak to chief minister in India, not just Nitish Kumar, when I've spoken to the other chief ministers of states in my role as the founding chairman of the UK India Business Council, every one of them has been appreciative of DFID's help. And they genuinely appreciate all of it. The Right to Public Services Act, that was put in thanks to DFID's help. So I do hope that that support will continue. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Karan, for sharing your own firsthand uh, experience of, of Bihar. And, and of course, to some extent, addressing also Danny's question on what are some of the areas in which DFID would be to be worthwhile for DFID to be continuing its engagement, and English is one thing which you mentioned, but generally improving the uh, teacher quality and improving the educational outcomes. But one good news that, which I must share with you, Karan, is that last week I was at a function in which the uh, 13th annual report of uh, the annual status of education done by India's largest uh, NGO, the Pratham, was uh, was unveiled and it showed a significantly improved educational outcome as far as Bihar is concerned on a couple of important parameters and perhaps some of these initiatives which you have mentioned could have had a role to play. Uh, uh, Sohail, you have also been going to Bihar for a long time. Uh, you were there initially when Nitish Kumar came with uh, a group of uh, industrialists and a group of other policy makers. How have you, how do you see this perspective? Uh, and how have you seen this change? And would you have any thoughts on this book, which is before us? Very rarely would uh, an average Indian go to Bihar unless his family was in some inexplicable way related to crime or loutish politicians or crooked industrialists. So I'm glad that perception is changing. Interesting that Curran talks about a brewery <clears throat> being set up in Bihar. It's not the perfect advertisement saying, come to Bihar and have a cobra. Because, you know, the connotations would be different, but he's right. I was saying this at the book launch on the 21st of December in Calcutta, and I'll repeat. Bihar today suffers from three problems. Number one, communication. Number two, communication. Number three, communication. What Bihar has been unable to do to my mind, which this book will perhaps address, to a great extent, is the changing paradigm of Bihar because governance has been the instrument of change. We've seen the same Bihari, we've seen the same Bihar citizen actually transform into a more responsible and a more responsive citizen. What is sadly missing is this whole federal state structure, which also needs to undergo a change. Uh, we've had a prime minister for the last five years uh, who's been in what I would call silent mode so once we kind of activate the powers that be in India, 
hopefully we'll see a change in this federal state imbalance uh, with due respect to the Indian High Commissioner, but he knows that I say it as it is. The second thing to my mind, which NK touched upon, which Lord Stern touched upon very correctly is, in order to bring about a change, you cannot equate Bihar with other states because the deprivation of Bihar was severe in the almost two decades that both these gentlemen talked about. Let me give you some interesting statistics about Bihar, which will tell you its, its remarkable position in both academia and government, as well as in the whole business of education. 50% of the doctors at India's premier medical institution, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, are from Bihar. So are 50% of the patients. So the opportunity in Bihar is for healthcare. And we haven't been able to establish healthcare in the manner we should have. Number two, Bihar is the largest consumer of allopathic prescription drugs. And yet there is not one pharmaceutical company which has a factory there. If you look at the per kilometer density of tutorial classes, it's got the highest in India. It contributes the maximum amount of people to the civil service, other than Mr. N.K. Singh, which perhaps blames, which perhaps explains the reason for why Bihar was left in the way it was, because these guys didn't want to ever go back. But I believe that what Nitish Kumar has done, and the essays in this book point in that direction, is that he's shown us two very important things. Number one, the tenor of governance can actually inspire both confidence and investment. You can't have a state of people who will inspire investment if they don't have the confidence to draw it. The second is, and, and Karan's point is absolutely right, you cannot have a situation where tomorrow you have another, you know, loutish kind of leader running Bihar, and we have a great propensity in India to choose people who will drive us towards governance suicide, as we are seeing in Delhi right now. So I wouldn't put it past, you know, the fine people of Bihar to vote in someone who will again jeopardize their future. But what we have seen in the last three or last two elections is that people have voted people back to power when development has been on the table. Ultimately, in democracy, citizens want two things, freedom of expression and the freedom of opportunity. Poverty is not unique to India. What is unique to some parts of India is the impoverishment of opportunity, which to my mind, Bihar has kind of obliterated over the last couple of years. I personally believe that the marketing of Bihar's potential remains a thing to be done. It remains on you know, the list of things to do. The second is, you talked very rightly about Nalanda and you know, Danny talked about TIFID. I think it is not about just contributing or, or, or aiding Bihar. It's also about making Bihar more and more self-sufficient. It must draw Indian capital as it draws multinational capital. You know, the Cobras and the Carlsbergs apart, it must draw investment from within India. And I think finally, and I'll end uh, with this, I believe the opportunity to showcase Bihar is in fact the best foot forward to showcase the progress that India can make if governance is set right. So it is a battle of governance. It is a battle that must be fought in order to win, to my mind, the war for growth. Thank you. And uh, uh, last, but certainly not the least, because uh, High Commissioner, you have an overarching view of the country as a whole since you represent India. Uh, what would be your perspectives on some of the issues uh, which this panel has, has been discussing? Thank you, N.K. I think, first of all, um, it is, of course, a truism that uh, no part of India is necessarily representative of the, the whole of India. But if you look at the story which we've been told about today and which unfolds in this book, uh, there is a sense that this glass half full or half empty, depending on where you sit or stand, uh, is absolutely true of India as a whole. And if you look at it, the issue of governance which we have identified suggests to me one thing, that given a relatively low base for a starting point, even small changes in policies, regulations, governance, and financial manage management can trigger rapid growth. Bihar has, in the whole of India has, favorable demography, rising investment, unfulfilled demand, and aspiration in droves. 
and these provide a basis for accelerating growth further. But to make it sustainable, it doesn't end there. And I think this book puts together in one volume a series of uh, options and uh, points to what actually needs to be done for moving on. It's not about governance only. Of course, there is a possibility of regression, as you mentioned, in an election. But this is only part of the story of what needs to be done. And I think uh, if you look at uh, one figure which Monte Kaluvalia has mentioned, of course, sir, your figures are somewhat different. He suggests that the, <laughs> the difference in the growth rates of Bihar and the rest of India, even if they are sustained at 1% for the next 20 years, at the end of those 20 years, Bihar will have a per capita GDP, which is only 40% that of the whole of India. So that's, I mean, even if it's two, you're, you're decades behind. So I think we also need to look at it from the other side of this equation. What is Bihar doing <coughs> to close the gap in the rate of growth of its population? And I think that's one issue which needs to be addressed. Because as you said, 50% of so many categories in India are people from Bihar. There are actually uh, people from Bihar in the state of Kerala looking for opportunities to work. And they are simply doing it because there are far too many people relative to the land available or in Bihar's current state of its economy. The other point I'd say is, I mean, I don't have personal experience of Bihar. I happened to share a room 40 years ago with a civil servant who went on to become the chief secretary of Bihar and who was at the cutting edge, sometimes quite literally, of this administrative revolution you were talking about. <laughs> Uh, but issues which we have discussed, energy, all right, we all know now that there's a power shortage. What is being done about it in terms of Bihar's own resources? The Gangetic Basin, according to the ONGC and the geological survey, is 180,000 square kilometers encompassing UP and Bihar, is prospective. Has the Bihar state government or has the private sector, or has somebody outside actually sought to create a unit within the state to see whether something can be done about prospecting? This is, uh, I think, an important area which uh, needs to be, to be looked at. Uh, there's also the question of railways. Now, I know it's uh, whenever you mention railways in the context of Bihar, people smile because Mr. Lalu Prasad Yadav was the railway minister, and we all know what he did. But there's a huge development project which is coming in, which is called the Dedicated Freight Corridor, mm. starting in Ludhiana and ending up in Dankuni, in, in Bengal. West Bengal. Yeah. And there's a small segment of it in the state of Bihar. But even with current resources, there are huge amounts that can be done to leverage this new opportunity which is opening up. So there are areas we need to look at beyond governance, beyond the, uh, the traditional uh, <coughs> factors which this uh, book has, in fact, spelt out uh, in, in some great detail. Nalanda has been uh, referred to, and I think it's a very important uh, thing. I was delighted that we have actually now signed the headquarters agreement between Government of India and the Nalanda <coughs> University, and I was privileged to be able to do that. Uh, there is a leverage which Bihar's unique legacy I mean, people think of it only in terms of Buddhism, but it's far more than that. Mm. And that could be done on a global level, and as I, you probably are right, communication is where the starting point of what we should be doing. But there are a number of areas, it seems to me, where Bihar could build on what has been achieved through governance to an accelerated takeoff in its economy. Thank you. I, I just, <clears throat> so with your, with your permission, I'd just like to leave the High Commissioner with a thought now that he embarks on being Mr. India in the United Kingdom. Please treat Montek Singh Alawalia's figures with abundant caution. Remember, he's the Deputy Chairman of India's Planning Commission. No, but uh, thank you, uh, Ranjan, for, uh, want, uh, for correcting my figures. To some extent, it only endorses uh, what I said and what Nick also said, that those states which are growing very rapidly need to be given more resources Absolutely. so that they are able to bridge the <coughs> gap between what are all India averages and what are Bihar rates of growth. So I think that what you said is a stronger endorsement of the point of view that uh, uh, Nick pointed out. Well, uh, I think that in two minutes or three minutes from now, uh, uh, Mr. Danny Alexander is to leave, 
But before you leave, can I ask you one, can I have the privilege of being the crew chair and asking you one question, if I might? It's a question to which you gave an answer uh, per se, uh, the issue of fiscal federalism. <laughs> that would you say that in all reasonableness, fiscal federal policies must aim at equalization on development rates by calibrating the progressivity of transfers from the central government to the fiscal entities? I think you need a mixture, actually, of two things. One is um, the point that you make, which is having transfers from the central authority which help to equalize, for, uh, which relate to need, which relate to economic conditions, and so on. Uh, but the other is uh, uh, arrangements that incentivize a degree of fiscal accountability and responsibility uh, in the governing authorities. So. Uh, uh, I think the idea that you have an arrangement which is simply about transfers means that the politicians in those areas, uh, uh, in receipt of those funds, are only responsible for decisions about how to spend money as opposed to having any uh, responsibility for how to raise money and therefore uh, I think that can often lead to bad decision making, to poor relationships between the centre and, 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 the, uh, and, and the, 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 the devolved uh, authority. And I think that in order to in order to create an incentive for the for the uh, for the devolved area to have uh, some interest in the rate of growth uh, and in the development of the economy, I think you also have to have some degree of responsibility for raising money for tax powers, for example, in, in those areas as well as uh, central transfers. Otherwise, you can end up in a, in a position where. Uh, uh, all that is depended on is the flow of money from the center, whereas if you are responsible, for example, for raising um, uh, uh, income tax, then you have an incentive to take an interest in the level of incomes of your population because you'll get more tax revenues for, your, for yourself. So I think there has to be uh, a balance to, in, you know, to ensure that there's a degree of fiscal accountability and responsibility as well as uh, a degree of um, uh, uh, central funding which relates to, to, to need. And I think that you would find that the, um, the, the, the best systems of uh, devolution, whether it's fully federal structures as you find in some countries or more asymmetric as you find in, uh, in this country, uh, will have a balance of those two things in order to work properly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the first part of uh, this panel discussion uh, now concludes, and I'm happy to hand over uh, to uh, Nick the second part, which is the Q&A. Can I say apologies? I now do have to leave, but thank you so much for inviting me, and I uh, hope the book is a, is, a, is a great success, as I'm sure it will be when all these people <laughs> here uh, buy a copy on their way out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Danny, for coming. Thank you again, Danny, for coming. It's very good of you. Now, we have um, just under half an hour for uh, questions and uh, answers. Um, can I ask you to uh, identify yourself um, and keep your, uh, keep your questions uh, brief, please? There are uh, roving mics. A gentleman just here. There's a mic just coming. Uh, Professor Stern and members of the panel, I'm a journalist, not an economist. My question is about um, an, uh, a moment of history in Bihar in 1943 in the Dwaba region near Patna, one of the focuses of the worst British colonial massacres, almost as bad as Jallianwala Bag. My question is, as you may be aware, um, Mr. Singh, this is the Dwaba region where during the monsoons, people proclaimed themselves an independent republic. When the colonial authorities came back, they hanged more than 120 people from the trees, 1943. If you can't account for the past and have some accountability, how can you deal with the future? My other second part of my question addressed to Mr. Singh is, Mr. Singh, you are so, if I may say this with all due respect, uh, apparently complacent and self-congratulatory in this venue at LSE. Isn't there a danger that some people might see you as an Uncle Tom, rather than an authentic voice of New India? Hmm? <laughs> Uh, the, the question on the, the uh, atrocities in 43 was directed to whom? To me. 
I must confess a very inadequate understanding of what happened. Uh, since, uh, like you, uh, I'm not a historian. Uh, I have only some pretensions of being the a, a student of the dismal science called economics. So uh, forgive my somewhat inadequate understanding of what happened in 1943, but I take your point. I think your second point really is that if you go through the contents of this book, this book deals as much of, about the inadequacies as about what has been done. The section that deals with glass half full and the crystal gazing are precisely about the unmet challenges and the huge amount of complexities in wanting to, in being able to sustain what has been achieved and the complex process of governance being fine-tuned to meet the emerging challenges. So this book is not about a, a cell for Bihar. This book is a chronicle of what has happened and a chronicle of the kind of achievements, but equally about the daunting challenges and the unfinished agenda. If, if I could just add, if you want to be very slightly numerical about the balance of the book, there are three chapters on uh, half full and six chapters on uh, half empty. So um, I don't think there's been any overlooking at the degree of uh, challenge that, uh, that remains and how difficult it will be, and that uh, the poverty percentage in uh, Bihar is still the highest amongst the major states of um, of India. Um, next question, please. There's a gentleman in glasses there. So I, I was thinking of a chap in the in, in the um, sweater. The Hi, my name's Raghav. Uh, my question is for N. K. Singh. Mr. Are, are you from? Uh, I'm from Soas. Very I'm good. In Soas. So I was in Bihar in Kelgaon less than a month ago, and one thing I saw: my family's been making cloth there for years and years. Why isn't the Nitish Kumar government doing anything about creating links between the center and the state to create rural funds coming in? Because the center has multiple schemes for revenue to come to rural areas for development, while these funds just keep lapsing every year. And there's no networks in either Bihar or many other states for this to create linkages to bring these funds, because we don't have to look outside. We have crores and crores of rupees in, in the Indian government, in the center, for these programs. But there are no local MLAs who know about it, none of the panchats, none of this. Why is this happening? Well, to put it in perspective, uh, in 2004 and five, the total size of the plan outlay of Bihar was $1.1 billion. The total size of the public plan outlay last year was $8.2 billion, an eight-fold increase in terms of public spending and outlay in a period of eight years. And it is indeed that which has given the multiplier catapulting effect to what you see in the rates of growth. But where you are right is that I think that the difficulty in being able to sustain this rate of growth is still we are able to catalyze private investment to really have and have more and more a public-private partnership, it would be difficult to sustain a 13% rate of growth only led by public outlays, because public outlay, which has increased very dramatically, cannot increase at the same sustained rate. And this particular sector which you are mentioning, that's a point I think that which deserves uh, greater attention. But a great deal of effort has been made in the integration of the rural economy with the mainstream economy of Bihar, because improving rural road network, which enhances farm incomes and which enables really uh, people in the rural area to sell their products expeditiously to where the markets are the best, that's something where the state has made very important and significant gains. Um, thank you, N.K. Now, we've got quite a lot of questions, so I'm going to take um, three at uh, a time. Um, a gentleman right behind uh, the, the chap, Arun, who just asked the question, and come down the front. <coughs> this is a question, Dr. Could, could Manmohan you give Singh. Your, uh, did, name, name, please. And oh, my name is Mohan from Tamil Nadu. Uh, this is a question Dr. Manmohan Singh did not put to Mr. N. N. K. Singh. When would Behar's per capita income of 30,000 30, rupees catch up with the 100,000 income in Maharashtra, Gujarat, and Tamil Nadu? When would Behar's highest 
birth rate in the whole of India catch up with the replacement rate of reproduction which has been achieved in the southern states? The answer to your first question depends on the rates of growth. If we continue to grow at 12% uh, <clears throat> for Bihar's uh, average uh, per capita income to catch up with the income of Maharashtra would take a long time, but to catch up with all India averages, as pointed out in the book itself, would be about 25 years. So I think the remedy to that lies that a 13% rate of growth is inadequate, and we would have to grow at a rate of growth which is perhaps even faster than that in order to bridge the gap more expeditiously. On the total factor, on the total TFR rate uh, coming up to all India norms, I think our expectation is that in the next five years, the replacement rates would average the all India replacement rates. There has already been a significant progress in the last five years. Thank you. Now, I'm going to try to go uh, quickly so that um, I can see a lot of questions, and I want to try to uh, give as many people possible. Um, the gentleman here in, in the suit, and then we'll go to the gentleman, um, uh, just uh, a couple up from Arun. Excuse me, Arun, for taking you as a locus of, uh, please. Thank you. Uh, Deepak Lalwani. Uh, you'll have mentioned about sustainability, very, very important for economic growth. But no mention has been uh, made at all about the mood of civil society in Bihar for change. Is there a movement which is against corrupt politicians and indeed poor governance which has held back? And is that going to make a change towards achieving sustainability? I believe that's a very major point. And, and what are your views on that, please? So if we could go to the gentleman there with, with the glasses, just a couple of... Yes, and then the lady behind, then I'll come over to this side of the hall. Hi, uh, my name is Apoof Chauhan. I'm a PhD student in social psychology at the LSE. And uh, my connection with Bihar is, um, uh, I was born in Bihar, and I, I lived all my life in Bihar. Uh, I should begin by saying that I'm not an economist, and therefore I'm not that um, excited by the trickle-down uh, theory of growth and how it, it actually the drop trickles down to the poorest bit is, is that best questionable. So my research at the LSE, I, I investigate poverty in Bihar uh, and I just spent six months doing my fieldwork there. So I, I, if I may nudge the, the discussion a little bit towards the, the social aspects of what is happening there. Uh, we, we talked a lot about uh, how education and health, Nick pointed us in that direction, are, are some of the important social indicators. And um, Mr. Singh mentioned uh, the USA report, which, which documents um, a, a development in the educational sector. But the question that I have is that the same as a report, it indicates that the qualitative achievement of pupils is actually on the decline. The numbers have gone up, but the, the, the actual attainment is on the decline. And if you actually go to a school in Bihar, I, I beg your pardon, but it's very little that has changed. I have lived all my life there, and I really, therefore, request a bit of conservative optimism when we speak of all these changes. Thank you very much. And lady behind you, please. Yeah, my name is Kalpana Wilson, and um, I'm from the uh, LSE Gender Institute. Um, we've heard a lot today about um, governance and uh, particularly the increase in security and also about uh, this idea that um, those who were previously excluded are now more included. Um, I think one of the um, things which has caused a great deal of concern in recent months has been um, the acquittal of all those who were convicted in, the two, in two of the major uh, massacres of uh, women and children, mainly from Dalit uh, and other poor communities. I'm talking about Lakshmanpur Bathe and Bathani Tola. Um, not only that, there's also a great deal of concern about uh, the closing down of the Amir Das Commission, which was investigating the Ranbir Sena before it was able to submit its report. And we've also seen things like um, in the wake of the murder of um, uh, the, the killing of Brahmeshwar Singh, the leader of the Ranbir Sena, his support is being allowed to uh, run a mock and attack uh, Dalit students and a Dalit hostel and so on. So I think these things are are you know extremely disturbing when we're talking in such um, you know glowing terms of uh, 
you know, better governance and greater exclusion, uh, greater inclusion, rather. Thank you very much. Uh, how would you like to divide those? Uh, NK, do you want to begin? Yes, uh, I think there are uh, three questions which have been posed. The first one, I think, is a very important issue which has been, which has been raised. And I think that one of, the, uh, one of the issues, or one of the initiatives which Danny pointed out, is an important thing, that Bihar was the first one to enact the Right to Services Act. In fact, uh, by now, uh, the number of people who have availed of the Right to Services Act is mind-boggling. And uh, India is still trying to struggle. The bill relating to the Grievance Addressal Act is pending in the Upper House of Parliament and hopefully in the February session along with other legislation that would be taken up. That coupled with many others, for instance, uh, uh, the, the very aggressive uh, Right to Information Act, which Bihar has practiced in a particular way, in which you don't have to make an application. You make a telephone call, which gets an automatic computer number and then uh, you can really chase up. So there are some of these initiatives which really in, in, uh, has gone a long way in improving the overall uh, milieu and in uh, minimizing the extent to which uh, uh, corruption at the middle and at the lower levels affects uh, the life of an average citizen. <coughs> to the second question um, on the ESSA report. You know, if you look at the ESSA report as a whole, this decline which you point out is an overall national decline. But one of the more remarkable things which uh, took me quite by surprise is when uh, uh, Montek was pointing out uh, who released the ESA report to, to Rukmini uh, on that day, was quite surprisingly uh, the record of uh, mathematics uh, 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 in Bihar is better than the record of mathematics in Tamil Nadu. Now, would you have expected a Bihari to do better than a Tamilian when it comes to solving sums? I mean, this is also brought out uh, in this essay report. So it's a, it's a mixed bag of story. I agree with you that uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, excessively optimistic conclusions need not be drawn. It will be a long haul. But the report does bring out the essay report 2013 the improvements in several directions, particularly in terms of bridging the gap uh, between uh, the, the gender issue. Uh, the dropout ratio for girls has uh, come down very, very significantly. Uh, the number of girls who are out of schools has come down very significantly. So there are these positive features. Uh, but I agree with you that, of course, there are many others where further effort needs to be taken. The last question. I think you need to break that question down into two parts. The issue of the verdict of the High Court, on which the state government, which you know very well, has little or no say, because there was no laxity on the part of the prosecution in pursuing the case, but it was the High Court which came to a conclusion on which the state government would have little or no, 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 no control. The issue would be whether the state government goes in appeal against that High Court judgment to a higher court to, to, to set aside that particular judgment. That's an issue on which I don't know the latest and I cannot comment on. I agree with you that there have been some of these setbacks uh, uh, which need to be addressed. And I would not want to be excessively complacent that unless we are vigilant, we shouldn't really allow the progress which we have made to slide back significantly. Now, um, I wanted to come down the sides. Lady, lady at the back, uh, this gentleman here has been very patient, and so have you, sir. <coughs> Anastasia Kapernik, BSR Russia magazine. Uh, I would like to ask you, so Bihar is a northern state, so it's located quite close to Russia. And what do you think? Is there an opportunity for um, the growth of tourism? between Russia and Bihar. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this gentleman here. Have you been reading Sarah Palin? <laughs> <clears throat> Hi, my name's Udit Gadkri. I'm a BSc economic student here at the LSE. Uh, my question is to do with the future of governance in Bihar. 
I mean, I think the first thing as an Indian you're looking at is the 2014 elections. And I think Nitish Kumar has come in and you know, has talked a lot about good governance and how good governance inspires confidence and that can you know, help to get growth. But you know, there's obviously a well-publicized um, you know, difference of opinion between him and Narendra Modi. And there is a big Modi wave which cannot be um, you know, overlooked. Do you not think that you know, if it's not even for his best per, uh, political ambitions, it is in the interests of the state of Bihar? to you know, maybe align more with his uh, and cooperate more with Narendra Modi and his ideas. Because you know, Nitish Kumar and him are both screaming the same thing, good governance. So you know, whilst it might not be the best for Nitish Kumar, do you think for the interests of Bihar, it is important that this is done? <coughs> Thank you. Um, the gentleman right here. Is there anybody screaming in favor of bad governance? Is the, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, indeed, Najmal Hassan. <laughs> Greenwich University and president of uh, Gopio UK. Gopio is the global organization for people of Indian origin. Uh, my question is, how have uh, Biharis living outside the state of Bihar in different parts of India, how have they contributed to this uh, half empty and half full glass? And also Biharis living outside India, is there any evidence of their contribution so far and the potential you see in the future. Thank you. Thank you. I'm actually going to just take one more. We have the, the FT's um, correspondence. Mr. Le uh, James Lemon, please. Can I? Hi, I'm James Lamont from the Financial Times. Um, a few years ago, in the last uh, parliamentary elections in India, I traveled with Mr. N.K. Singh uh, across Bihar. And there's one figure that I remember. I may have it slightly wrong, and so he'll, he'll correct me. We were in a helicopter traveling the length of the state, and uh, we went over a cement factory. And he said, um, correct me if I'm wrong, N.K., um, Bihar attract, has attracted $60 million worth of foreign investment. This is a direct foreign investment. This is a state of 80 million people and must be one of the least invested places in the world. I just wondered whether that had changed um, in recent years. And if it hadn't, what will change it? And anyone on the panel can, can answer that. Thank you very much. So we've got um, Russia and uh, Bihar, the future of governments, <coughs> and uh, this year's elections. Bihar is outside Bihar and foreign investment in Bihar. Um, Karan, do you want to say something about foreign investment in Bihar? Yeah, I was going to volunteer to take the last one, but I'll take the last question first. Um, I think that you've got to put things into perspective. Um, my our colleague, uh, our colleague um, Meghna Desai, is also a contributor to this book. And he uh, has drawn some graphs in his chapter, making the uh, relationship between governance and equity and growth, saying that if you have good governance, you should be able to have more equitable, whether it's equitable in terms of the Gini index, equitable in terms of men and women. Um, you should be able to have, be more inclusive. Uh, and, and you will grow faster. But the missing piece is, is and, and but all the panelists have spoken about this, and Suhail has spoken about this, about confidence and communication. He, didn't, he missed out one graph, which is investment. You can't do any of these things unless you have the investment, and you're only going to get the investment if it comes through with Bihar getting special category status. That would help. There's no question about it, and it deserves it, because it's doing the right things over the last few years to show that it's creating, trying to create the environment for growth, and that would really help. And next is getting investment in. Now, if you're talking about investment in terms of FDI, which is what I've done with Molson Coors Cobra, that's all very well. And what is FDI? FDI only counts if you're investing more than 10% of an institution, which means it's going to be permanent investment. We're in there for the long term. Hot money? There's no hot money possibility in Bihar. <laughs> there are no stock exchanges for money to go in and out. Turkey is susceptible to hot money. India sometimes is susceptible to hot money. In Bihar, you need permanent investment. And what better than to come, as Suhail said, from our own companies within India that could invest? There's a lot of talk. I'm going to put up this plant. I'm yeah. going to put up 500 stores <coughs> here. <coughs> Nothing. We're the only ones who've done anything. And now Carlsberg have followed. But I have confidence that it will happen. And you've got to put this into perspective, what NK has said. This is only eight, eight years. $1 billion to $8 billion. The magnitude of the problem, 100 million people. 
the poverty that is abject. I see it every time I go there. We put in a water pump in a village near our brewery. There were people in tears of gratitude thanking us for the water pump. Sanitation in schools, just basic things. There's no piped water in the states. There's no electricity in so many parts. There's not a single power plant in the state. So if all those things come together, then the investment will fly into Bihar because it's a huge consumer market when urbanization <coughs> starts. Mm. But we've made a start, and you've got to give it time. And it is a glass half full. Now, we cannot possibly ask the High Commissioner to comment on the future of elections in, uh, in India, but uh, uh, in relation to governance. Um, but, Suhel, you probably, I'm speculating you might want to say something. <coughs> I know Manmohan Singh is not going to be our next Prime Minister, uh, because he himself has said so. But uh, if you go back into history, India has never predicted a future Prime Minister. So the young man there who thinks it's either Modi or Nitish, you'll have to think again. We've had some of the worst accidents becoming our prime ministers, and the really terrible ones have done really well. The really good ones have performed miserably. So, you know, actually, <clears throat> if I may end by saying, India is like the bumblebee. Aerodynamically, the bumblebee isn't supposed to fly because of its physical structure. <clears throat> but you see, the bumblebee doesn't know that, so it flies happily. <laughs> If you were to put an LSE yardstick on India, we'd have failed long ago. But see, we don't know LSE yardsticks. The only guy who does is Montek Singh Alovali, and now you know why the Planning Commission is where it is. <laughs> so we don't know who our next Prime Minister is. I, in, in defense of the LSE and Montek, I should say he went to Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> well, that says it all. <laughs> only if he had come to LSE. <laughs> India would have been such a different place. <laughs> the, uh, we do do counterfactuals at the uh, at the LSE. <laughs> um, Bihar is outside Bihar. That's N it. N yeah, I think that's a <clears throat> very important uh, question. <clears throat> well, two things. First, I think that uh, remittance incomes uh, from Biharis working outside Bihar has been a very important boost to the state GDP of Bihar. What are we trying to do about it? We are certainly trying to prevent Biharis from going out of Bihar seeking opportunities out of compulsions of poverty by inculcating skills so that when they go out, they are going out for higher value-added activity than out of the compulsions of uh, uh, just a lack of opportunities and driven by abject poverty. In terms of trying to secure the diaspora uh, and getting them more involved in Bihar, uh, that's an area in which uh, the Bihar Foundation is doing significant work uh, in many areas, and you'd certainly like to encourage the diaspora from getting more involved. But I think that I must <coughs> tell you, really, uh, uh, one of the flip side of that is um, the fact that when the development of the state has caught on, the migratory trends from Bihar have got moderated. And I think that I remember that when um, Bihar uh, ministers went to Surat, they got a royal welcome in Surat. So they were wondering why are they getting such a big welcome in Surat. It turned out to be that the, the, they were really pleading that please encourage the Bihari workers to continue to come in Surat yeah. because the entire German jewelry industry of Surat will come to a grinding halt if there was any uh, slowdown of the Bihari workers going there. The same is equally true of um, the agricultural pattern. I mean, the High Commissioner very rightly pointed out that Bihari workers have gone now to Kerala. Let me tell you that, for instance, the finance minister told me the other day that uh, Bihar has suddenly become very important in my own constituency in remote Tamil Nadu. This is because there are 1.5 lakh Bihari workers engaged in his constituency in Tamil Nadu. Uh, this is because perhaps Tamilians have uh, done something else to, for their livelihood, and all Keralites have gone to seek job opportunities perhaps in the Middle East. So I think that the dependence on migratory trends in India has been. So Bihari workers have shown their presence not only as far as uh, <coughs> Surat and uh, Punjab is concerned, which are traditional patterns, but way down into Tamil Nadu and to Kerala. What the Bihar government is trying to do is to prevent this kind of flow of migratory worker driven from just out of sheer abject poverty, but to inculcate 
uh, skills and to inculcate greater value-added migration so that the remittance incomes can be significantly increased. Thank you. Um, the uh, tourism from Russia to Bihar. Well, the only link I can think of is, uh, well, you know, tourism from Russia and Bihar. I think that certainly in the outer circumference of the greater <laughs> Buddhist tourist circuit, <laughs> Uh, perhaps if we are able to look to footprints, I mean, there's certainly um, the importance of tourism in Bihar would be a very growing one, as the Nalanda University, where I'm privileged to be on the board of that university, has now begun to really take off. And I think that the, that entire area in terms of the historical tourism, uh, cultural heritage, uh, is something which is gathering momentum. Certainly one can forge tourism links uh, uh, between Bihar <clears throat> and to other parts of the world. For starters, convert Putin into Buddhism, to Buddhism. <laughs> that may might I, start. I, may I just add one point there? I think uh, Mr. N.K. Singh is absolutely right, but it doesn't end only with Buddhism. But there is in historical literature in Russia this notion of the Ganga as a very special river. And, uh, you know, it's mystical elements just like the Volga <laughs> has in Russian history. And I think there's something we could do on it to develop, uh, say, riverine tourism uh, down the Ganga. Uh, I say this because 15 to 20 years ago, uh, I don't think there were many Russians visiting Goa. But the numbers there are now among the largest among the foreign uh, visitors to Goa are actually from Russia. And I would conclude by saying that in terms of the diaspora, there's even a historical legacy which is even older. Every single program of the Pravasi uh, events in India, the Roots program, shows that the people from Fiji, from Guyana, from Mauritius, millions of them, if you add them up, South Africa, have a link somewhere in Bihar, Bihar. of yeah. which they are very proud. <coughs> True. And when they go there, it's the average Bihari who wonders how these people who are not in advanced industrial countries are so much better off than they are. I may just add to that. Um, famous Victoria Cross winner here, Johnson Bihari, from the Caribbean. Bihari is originally from Bihar. And it's remarkable, I mean, the way these, these links. And also talking about the Ganges, High Commissioner mentioned, um, I went to see with Montek, um, uh, who, who introduced me to this, to see the Gangetic dolphins just outside Patna and the Ganges. What beautiful creatures, and you know there are fewer Gangetic dolphins than there are tigers in India. And we've got to preserve them, we've got to try and conserve them, and they're magnificent creatures, stunning and beautiful. Thank you very much. Surely investing in the historical sites, investing in uh, the museums, investing in the natural reserves um, is an enormous, op enormous opportunity for uh, tourism uh, in, in India. And, um, I think those of us who've been going to India as outsiders, in my case, for 40 years, have also f always felt um, that there's a big gap between the potential uh, of the wonderful sites and historical sites in India and what is actually uh, realized. So it seems to me that if you're talking about um, public and private investment coming together, that could really be uh, a very important area. Now, we have to finish um, at eight, which is just um, about 30 seconds past, and um, you have to have time to buy your copy of the uh, book, <laughs> which is being sold outside for the ludicrously small sum of 10 pounds, I think. So it remains for me to um, thank the uh, panel, but I do want to um, make one link, because uh, Suhail mentioned prime ministers and silence in relation to India at the LSE. There is one very famous communication by a British Prime Minister um, to a, a rather difficult LSE professor, Harold Lasky, who is very closely connected with India, who, as uh, chairman of the Labour Party, went off to the United States and started saying outrageous <laughs> things, which was his want. He, Harold Lasky taught my mother when she was at the LSE, I hasten ah. to uh, add. And there's a famous... Um, line from Clement Attlee, the Prime Minister, who was uh, <clears throat> noted for his brevity. And Clement wrote, um, Dear Harold, a period of silence on your part would be welcome. Yours, <laughs> Clement. <laughs>
it's, a, <coughs> it's a note, of course, which many of us have been tempted to write on a number of uh, occasions. <laughs> but I hasten to add, not tonight, because uh, I enjoyed the discussion enormously. Um, I want to thank again um, NK for being the, um, as they say in India, the life force behind uh, this book. Um, thank our panelists very much for coming. Um, uh, Karan and Ranjan and Suhel and uh, Danny in his absence, and of course you, NK, the co-chair of this evening. Thank you all very much for uh, Thank you. coming. Thank you. And, uh, <clears throat>